Hello, my name is Fraser Simons. This is my channel, Springboard Thought. Hope you're doing well. Today I'm going to do a book review. I'll see how many I get through, uh, depending on the time constraints that I place on myself with no more than 30 minutes, hopefully. Um, a book review I have already uh, done is the Netanyahu's, which is the first in this, uh, this order, so I'll be quite quick. I gave it four stars. I liked it quite a bit. It is a pretty complex academic comedy, which is very important to know. It's coached in very academic language. The meta construction of it is sort of the t satirical bent that it goes through, uh, and it has a through line of absurdism that uh, greatly <laughs> increases near the end. Um, and I think the average reader who picks this up will be surprised <laughs> by it. It's pretty dense, uh, the flow is pretty great though. It's got a lot of personality and it has a lot to say on revisionism um, in regards to Israel and how that sort of ballooned, I guess, as a way of thinking and how we think about it today by looking at a historical fiction lens through the eyes of a professor at a fictitious school, uh, a historian, Jewish man, who is um, basically given the task of vetting a person of interest uh, for professorship in the same uh, historic department. And um, history de department, not historic. Um, and he is to be part of a committee that either allows or disallows uh, Ben Zion Netanyahu, the father of the leader of Israel for some time and the sort of propagator of revisionist history. Uh, and he essentially just is having to deal with this person who is at odds with him. It's a very like diasporic um, Jewish identity versus a sort of colonial type mindset, but also European intrinsic situation and the ideologues of those personalities uh, fighting, but then the whole story is revisionistic as well in that sense that Harold Bloom told the story to Joshua Cohen, the author, and then uh, Cohen has sort of revised it himself to make it do what he wants, essentially. I thought it was very good. There's a little bit of middle book syndrome where it's like we could be getting to the point a little faster, um, but otherwise I think it's uh, wildly ambitious and the fact that it exceeded my expectations means that it, I think in this particular case it's even you know better than people might gauge a four-star rating. Next I read The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. Uh, most people have probably already read this. Uh, it chronicles the life of a woman who is eventually institutionalized and her sort of uh, journey throughout. It's a cornerstone feminist text. It is a queer reading text in the case of uh, people not knowing if the woman is expressly uh, a lesbian or bi, I suppose, as well, because she has so much internalized misogyny and patriarchal notions that she regularly has to uh, push down her identity or aspects of her identity in nearly every interaction that she has. It's very critical of men, as you might expect, uh, in, I think, very, like, elegant and interesting ways, actually. Um, it has great prose, fantastic, I would say. The character work is great. It's a, uh, more complex than I was even expecting. It exceeded my expectations at four stars. Um, and it is uh, quite short, doesn't overstay its welcome. The ending is absolutely perfect. I think that's all I've got to say about it, really. So, but the bell is well known, <laughs> I, I recommend it. Um, and I'm glad that I finally was able to get to it. Next is going to be The Lathe of Heaven by Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, I need to read more Le Guin. I have not uh, disliked anything that I've consumed by her. Uh, everything has been fantastic and I need to get to more for sure. So this is what I would say like a masterwork essentially of uh, science fiction. It is about a man who believes that when he dreams, his subconscious wills the world 
into uh, conforming to whatever it is he is dreaming. He is remaking the world as he dreams, essentially. He goes to a uh, analyst, like a therapist, psychoanalyst person who doesn't initially believe him, but as their relationship develops, it becomes a lot more about um, examining societal and systemic issues through the lens of two different identities. And more terrifying, at least for me, I, I identified very much with its examination of an identity that had to be presented with an opportunity um, that could kind of like corrupt them essentially and what that does to a person. Also the notion of uh, people not being wholly aware of who they are, what they are, what they're capable of um, without the lens of another gaze on them. Um, and it's just a, a very interesting and I could see why it's like a sort of cornerstone work. It's definitely dated in some aspect, aspects. And I think people sometimes shelve it as like uh, dystopian in some ways, but in that it examines the human condition. It examines sort of uh, through a technological lens, the human experience, the nature of humanity, and sort of the, the nature of our modernity and selves being molded by the societal constructs that we have developed and so in that sense I think it will be an eternal work in which it can convey something. As I said it still is quite dated in some aspects of it um, but it's definitely a fast read, easy to consume, great dialogue. In contrasting this to Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep for instance the prose work and thematic work is just completely on point and excellent. Next, I consumed Olga Dies Dreamin' by Sochel Gonzalez. I uh, consumed this on audio as well. Um, the narration was quite good for people wondering. It's a story of a brother and sister both sort of like on a come up, uh, but also spotlighting how they've had to make concessions to their identity in order to do so, compromise themselves, their beliefs or uh, various values in order to allow themselves to believe that they are in a trajectory in which they belong um, and that does not compromise them even as it does um, and then so that way the the person consuming the reader is probably more aware of what is happening than the characters, even though there's a multi-lens uh, look at things. And it's also an incredibly ambitious project in which it goes into gentrification, uh, the relationship of Puerto Rico to America, uh, lots of different things with uh, politics, politicians, identity politics, uh, social justice, racism. While the main sort of plot is both plotting and is like, I would say simple, the fact that it tries to interact with so many different aspects uh, without really saying anything substantive about any one of them, and then kind of drawing to a conclusion that was unsatisfying and deus ex machina, I would say, it, it just became very contrived as it went on. And so I gave this book two stars. I thought it was easy to consume and the prose work would have probably been good on the page based on narration, but it simply does not actually deliver on any aspect, even from the plot perspective where the contrivance for the conceit of the story just didn't really work for me, nor did the conclusion. But I think that a lot of other people really enjoyed this. It does seem like there's a bit of uh, satire that's fit into it. It even covers like rap, it covers uh, radicalization. There's just, <laughs> there's just so much going on that it just feels like nothing is actually substantively resolved is the main point, I think. Next, I consumed Elena Knows by Claudio Pinheiro. This was great. Um, Elena was a fantastic protagonist because she is deeply flawed and doesn't know it, essentially. 
she is suffering from Parkinson's uh, in a way that she does not uh, shake, but she has other symptoms, including uh, memory issues, I believe. And her daughter is found um, hung, ostensibly suicide. Elena knows she has not done this. She wouldn't go around the church when it was raining, for instance, uh, and it was raining that night. And so there's various signifiers telegraphing to Elena that she knows that this couldn't happen and she's doing basically kind of like harangues the, the police officer in charge of the investigation in order to get the investigation going, um, supply them with information, and eventually investigate herself. The book itself is broken up into th four different parts, I believe. The pills that she takes for her um, uh, diseases, symptoms to be alleviated, but it also is a dual timeline narrative too, I would say, in which each chapter more or less, if I remember correctly, delves back into her history with her daughter and predominantly highlights the issues of her health to everybody as well. Um, it was extremely elucidating in that and also is very big at um, positing feminist and social justice issues through the lens of disability. Um, and I don't know about you, but in Argentina, I know nothing about uh, any of these issues. So it was very elucidating, but it seems like something that would track to Western culture, especially America's healthcare system, though I couldn't be sure of that living in Canada. So um, it's very interesting because it couples the this sort of like loose, genre expectation thing about the the murder and then completely subverts it with the uh, actual individual doing the investigation but then also subverts expectations in the in the fact that like where the story actually goes is surprising and not exactly conforming to genre expectations so in probably every respect it's subversive in some way or another uh, the pros are interesting. I gave it four stars, not five, mainly because I did not like the actual structure, like how the paragraphs were formulated. I think I kind of understood where she was going with the formulation, but it made it dense for a, in a way that I didn't think was very productive for the person consuming the book. Uh, I think it might have been trying to lump together um, scenes, thoughts, feelings, into a jumble to sort of simulate uh, Elena's thinking, perhaps. But when I examined the paragraphs to see if that was the case, where it was broken up and where it wasn't, uh, seemed to not be consistent either. And so if that's not the case, then it was just structured in such a way as to be obtuse for no reason, um, which I disliked even more. Uh, so either way, I would say that knocked me out of the flow state more often uh, and became the most annoying front, I guess, that I uh, had with the book. Whereas everything else about it, I quite enjoyed, including how flawed every single character is. There's an examination of uh, dogma in religion and the other uh, elements that I mentioned, social justice, disability. Um, it's surprisingly intersectional, gets a lot done in a short amount of time, very quick read, good stuff. Next, I consumed In by Will McPhail. I returned this to the library, but it's very quick. Uh, it's a graphic novel. I gave it five stars. Actually, uh, Shelley Swearingen told me about this book, um, and I'm very grateful for that because it was fantastic. It's about a millennial who uh, ostensibly like has lost his feeling. Like he's, he's sort of um, completely disassociated, maybe is the right word. And he keeps putting himself through semi-hilarious, semi-sad <laughs> situations in which uh, he thinks it would provoke feeling in him, um, like testing his, uh, the parameters of which will cause emotion in him. And he eventually navigates to certain characters that do provoke emotions into him. And when that happens, the graphic novel shifts into actual color instead of um, sort of like monotone. Um, and I found it really surprisingly effective, wildly, wildly funny, uh, like 
millennial humor for sure, but it just completely worked on me. There's a lot of play on words. There's a lot of like sort of in jokes, building a ecosystem of referential material, very millennial stuff essentially. Uh, and I like the artwork. People's eyes kind of looked freaky in this book. Um, so I thought it was gonna be like a horror story or something, but it's not. <laughs> it's uh, about finding out why this particular person is uh, feeling the way that they are and what um, they sort of do about it, basically. It's very simple, it's very quick, the plot is excellent, the revelation's very good, um, and I like the artwork quite a bit, but the highlight, I think, is the humor. Absolutely fantastic. Next, I consumed 1Q84 by Murakami. This is the book that I'm gonna do a dedicated review on because I hated it. I gave it one star, even though I finished it, which would usually mean two stars, but it's just simply the most incompetent work of maximalism I've ever consumed. It fails to deliver on absolutely every single front. Uh, character work, theme, message, none of it is cogent or even there in some ways. It lays things that are interesting off to the side. The pacing is abysmal. Each part, um, because it's divided into book one, two, three, is not segregated in such a way that it's even like a, a story that you can consume, like book one, and it has like a full plot cycle or uh, anything like that. You have to consume every single part to get what you, uh, the entire story essentially, in, in order to even uh, judge it. And so you're just constantly propelled. <laughs> Most of the plot action happens in parts one and two, uh, three quarters of every single character is through uh, a passive lens, in more, more passive than you could possibly imagine. Like, in some cases, physically inactive for three quarters of a book. Um, and what it's about, kind of, <laughs> without spoilers, is uh, two characters, Tango, who is a writer, is tasked with uh, rewriting a story while keeping it sort of ethos, I guess, uh, from a young woman who submitted a story that could have been very good, and they sort of collude in order to rewrite the story and submit it for um, acclaim, basically. On the other hand, there's a woman who uh, is a like contract killer, essentially, who only targets men who hurt women, uh, and she ostensibly, at the very beginning, this is not a spoiler, uh, slips into an alternate reality, perhaps, um, while things wildly get more contrived and different as that goes on. Uh, and eventually their paths converge, their stories and histories are divulged in um, sort of bite-sized granular details, as you imagine as you can imagine, uh, it, Murakami has done this in a very like surrealistic, dreamlike quality way um, but again I think it fails on all fronts so I don't want to talk about it too much because I don't even think it's worth your time I don't think it's worth anyone's time next I consumed Nervous Conditions by TC uh, Danarangma and this was a four-star read I don't have too much to say about it it's coming of age uh, feminism intersections in Zimbabwe I think it's like a cornerstone maybe like a classic type thing or a modern classic for um, Zimbabwean, hopefully that's the right term, lit. Um, and it, I believe it's sort of like prophetic in sort of galvanizing women to um, try to garner more rights there. But it is about a girl who is really intelligent, very smart, comes from poverty, and is trying to get to school um, in a like actually just pay for fees and, and get there like just be able to take some classes that's all she wants essentially and because she comes from poverty the son is favored instead they don't have the money in order to do this um, and she conspired uh, along with a another individual to uh, essentially get the fees in a kind of underhanded way but kind of a brilliant way to be honest and get school um, get get to school and be able to continue her work but it's 
more about the coming of age angle of it as well as just showcasing exactly what that sort of culture is like and also the really strong injustice that she suffers um, and is obviously an analogous to all the women in the country at the time. So I think it does exactly what it sets out to do but the prose work is really stand out. I remember um, this was narrated uh, phenomenally. Every character was really distinct and had a really interesting personality. The prose work was phenomenal because uh, generally you can tell in a narration if prose work is singular because narration tends to like tramp down uh, prose work I would say like it smooths it out unless the narrator is really phenomenal but typically I think that's true and in this one it just uh, had a lot of personality and came through regardless with absolutely everything so I thought it was just really phenomenal then I read Time as a Mother also narrated by Ocean Vuong um, this was absolutely amazing. I don't know what to say about it really. Uh, I don't know much about poetry so I wouldn't take what I take away from it unless maybe you're a complete layman to poetry as well. I don't really connect with his stuff on the page. I already know this about me from consuming his other work um, but I do really resonate with his spoken word so I gave this a shot on narration and it yeah, it was just absolutely phenomenal. There was a couple that kind of missed the mark, but I don't know if that's because I just didn't know what he was going for or if I, you know, missed it um, or if it was a craft level thing. I just don't know how to evaluate um, poetic prose or poetry itself, uh, especially through narration and not on the page. So all I can really say is that my four out of five stars is like, more how normal Goodreads people, I guess, rate it, where it's just like an approximation of enjoyment, meaning it wasn't completely awesome all of the time, but it had some of the highest highs um, that I've experienced with his uh, work before. And uh, not some of the lowest lows, but it still exceeded my expectations, were, which were quite high because I've consumed his stuff before. So next I consumed Rue by Kim Tui. Uh, I gave this four stars. I read M, E M, the novel that she wrote last year, I think, long listed on the Giller Prize, so maybe the year before that then. Uh, I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. This is in the same vein. It's uh, Vietnamese, uh, she's Canadian, Vietnamese, uh, French, and I believe writes originally in French and then translated herself into English. Fairly certain, not 100% sure. Um, it's phenomenal stuff. I describe her stuff as like vignettes that are sort of like w w photographs of like wartime photography that kind of like come alive into short scenes. That's how the vignettes sort of feel. They get across really vivid uh, sensory details as well as imagery and then sort of flit away and construct like another photographic image thing vignette <laughs> uh, it's hard to explain but it's it's very effective I really like her writing it's very poetic um, so some people won't like the sort of flowery language and prose I gave this four stars uh, it still exceeded my expectations from what was said at the beginning of the book I do think M is the superior book which kind of makes sense because it's the iteration of this process presumably but excellent stuff it covers mostly uh, I don't know if it's uh, inserting her uh, memories or not, but it covers a young girl in Vietnam who has like, basically is remembering cultural moments for her um, and how that culture sort of differs from ostensibly Canada now, but who knows. And um, the, the, um, spotlighting I guess of different cultural moments was really fascinating there's a lot of different um, ritualistic practices and daily life that obviously differs quite a bit there's some stuff about the war uh, people remembering the war uh, her grandmother is very present but because of the vignettes and the flitting 
nature of it. I would just say it's very like plotless, right? It's more about remembering the specific moments and constructing a character around those things than um, telling uh, something with a plot. So go into that with that information. And then lastly, Writers and Lovers by Lily King. I just finished. I gave it four stars. This, uh, so I would describe this as like a post MFA, MFA book <laughs> in which the character has clearly, um, is a writer, went to an MFA school, uh, and now in, at 31 years of age, I believe, is a waitress and is trying to write. She meets two different guys that are uh, very different. One is much older and has a family and is divorced, I believe. Or perhaps he's widowed. Um, I can't remember. The wife is not in the picture anymore. He's raising his sons. And then the other person is a really uh, famous writer, I guess. And she is just sort of really moored in the experience of being an older sort of millennial negotiating this. Her father is estranged from her. Her mother herself is dead as well. And through that confluence like grief versus shame and disappointment regarding her father and similar sort of shame and disappointment with herself and where her life is going um, she was like a former athlete uh, for golf and could have done something with that but an event occurs in which that is no longer viable for her um not because not like a physical injury or something but a traumatic event essentially that divorces her love of the game basically so i would say it then segues into like a romance but is really steeped in just doing the experience it's it does have somewhat of a plot i mean will she end up with one of these guys maybe you know is she gonna finish her book is she gonna publish the book these are questions that are natural in the book but don't feel too predominant in terms of spotlight. It's more about her thoughts and feelings towards um, a similar sort of ecosystem of referential material, like I mentioned before with millennial fiction. She does this a lot. She'll bring up certain books and characterize uh, the person's personality through their um, internalization of a particular book, which is a device I particularly enjoy probably because I'm a millennial, but <laughs> I think it's really effective in this book. I do feel it meanders somewhat, but when it does hit its stride and it's sort of dwelling in verisimilitude that makes it feel like it validates this sort of experience and kind of conveys a sort of poetic uh, human malaise and experience, it's absolutely phenomenal at it. It does get lost along the way from time to time in particular scenes that pull it away and maybe even make it feel a little bit cringe, but it is supposed to do that, I think. Um, she's supposed to feel a little bit immature and a little bit naive and a little bit um, get over it and, and do the thing kind of thing um, ingrained in it, yet some of those scenes in particular didn't work yet the juxtaposition of those things in which it's she's just sort of dwelling in her in herself and going through these particular motions of life were absolutely phenomenal so i wasn't quite the five uh star experience that some people had but it definitely exceeded my expectations at four stars and i would definitely recommend it i've heard this is sort of the peak writing uh, for this author at the current moment. Uh, if anyone else has read any King, I'd be very curious to know that. This is an author I would read again, I think, if there's stuff that um, sort of transcends this material. Otherwise, I'll just write, you know, wait for the next book like everybody else. And that's it. That's my week in reading. I uh, will see you next video. As usual, feel free to comment. Let me know if you've read any of these books, what you think of them. I'm sure some people are not going to be enjoying the 1Q84 take, but I really hated that book. <laughs> I really think it's incompetent. Um, so I'm sorry if you're a Murakami fan and you love that book. 
maybe you can tell me what you love about it. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I'll see you next video. See you later.